I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 is our text today. And uh, if you're with us and you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles and the seats around you and uh, turn to page 1051 and you'll be able to, uh, to follow along with us in that text. Now, if you're uh, uh, not in the room, if you're joining us online or, hey, to our Parker campus, glad that you're joining us today. Uh, if, uh, if you're at our Parker campus and you want a Bible, then there's a table right in the back. You can get up right now, go grab a Bible, turn to page 1051, and you'll be able to follow along. If you're joining us online, uh, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, we can't give you a Bible right now. But if any of you at any of our campuses, whether you're online in Parker or right here in the Sweetwater campus, would like a Bible, you don't have one and you want one, uh, if you're in one of our campuses in the physical location, take one of those with you. Just take it with you. We want you to have a Bible and read the Bible. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just let us know. Message the host or uh, email us at the church office and we will get you a Bible. We want everyone to read God's Word and apply God's Word, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. So uh, if you want one, take one. That, that's, uh, that's how we feel here at Calvary. Hey, uh, before we dive into the message, can I just reinforce what Pastor Pete said about Next Steps classes? Uh, there's Sunday night uh, here at Sweetwater. The, the, most of them start at six o'clock. Intro, grow, and serve start at six o'clock, so you can come for those. They're about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, if you want to do the deep dive and go do lead, uh, I'm teaching that Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock. And, and so we'd love to have you come and participate on that. If you've signed up, great. If you haven't signed up, great. We'll make room for you. We just want you to take that next step in following Jesus. So uh, how many of you wear glasses or contacts? Okay. Oh, that's a lot of hands. Wow. How many of you have had LASIK surgery? Just curious. Oh, a lot of you have. I should ask, if you've had LASIK service, do you still wear glasses? I won't do that. Uh, I have been visually impaired since I was eight years old. Or as I like to put it, blind as a bat. I couldn't see stuff. I, and I just thought it was normal. I didn't know that I had poor vision. And I just lived in a blurry world. I thought everybody saw lights, you know, kind of like, you know, lit up dandelions. Anybody with me on that? I still take my glasses off when I'm looking at the Christmas tree lights because it's prettier that way. Uh, <laughs> it just looks cool. Uh, I didn't understand why when people say, oh, look at that, I never could see that, whatever that was. Uh, I, I just assumed it was normal in school not to be able to see the chalkboard, right? There'd be assignments written up there, and I just thought nobody else could read them either, and I'd always get up and go ask the teacher a question so I could read the board. I just didn't know it. I lived that way until when I was about 10 and a half, they tested my vision, and my parents felt really bad, uh, and I got glasses at 10 and a half, and I could see. I cannot even describe the, the emotion, the feeling I had when they put glasses on my face, and I went, that's what the world looks like. That's what clarity is. Wow. Physical vision is a wonderful thing. Spiritual vision is a wonderful thing as well. Today I want us to look at a story that occurred on the first Easter. And, uh, and give, I want us to give ourselves a spiritual vision test. You know, we all know what the vision test physically looks like. You sit there, you have to name letters or say which way they're pointing or uh, all this kind of stuff. Is it clear this way or this way? We all get that. But spiritual vision test might be a little, uh, a little more nuanced than that. We're picking up the story in Luke 24. Uh, the first half of the chapter is about the women finding the tomb empty, uh, encountering the angel, running back, telling the disciples. Peter went and found the tomb empty uh, and, and didn't really understand all that that entailed. And the, the story picks up there. And I'm just going to read a few uh, verses at the beginning and the end. Verse 13, that very day, Easter morning, Two of them, disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that have happened. The women finding the empty tomb, the angel, the disciples, all that. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, 
Jesus joined them and walked seven miles with them to the village of Emmaus and uh, asked them what was going on. And they said, what, do you, you know, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't have a clue? I know you've never felt that way, right? And, and, and then uh, as they told him what happened, he began to explain to them how the scripture said the Messiah had to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And they got to Emmaus and they said, hey, it's late. We're gonna stay here. Why don't you come in and eat with us? And Jesus went in and let's pick up the story. Verse 30, when Jesus was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then Jesus vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. Now the story ends as they're explaining all this to the 12, or to the 11 that are left over, the disciples, Jesus appeared in their midst. But that's the sermon for next week, so I'm not gonna go there. I just read this and wonder, how can you miss Jesus when he's right in front of you? How can you miss Jesus when he's right there in front of you? Now, I know in this account, you know, that God prevented them from understanding who Jesus was, and that was part of God's plan to teach the disciples and reveal the resurrection to them so they could understand it fully. But the same thing kind of happens to us, just like those disciples. I mean, we follow Jesus, we believe in Jesus, we worship Jesus, but sometimes we can still miss Jesus when he is right in front of us. How do we do that? What, what is it that causes us to miss our Savior when he's right there? Well, I, I think distractions cause us to miss Jesus. Maybe it's current events. Maybe it's the wars and the tragedies and the politics, and we get so absorbed in what's going on right in front of us that we can miss Jesus. I mean, they were talking about a current event as they walked with Jesus. And they're like, how could you not know this? Kind of funny when you think about it. Uh, and, it and, you know, distraction might be grief. I mean, they, their eyes were blinded by grief. They, they were uh, not paying attention. And, and so their grief kept them from seeing it. Sometimes our distractions are just busyness, our problems that we're facing. Maybe it's fear that keeps us from seeing Jesus. Sometimes that what keeps us from seeing Jesus is our expectations. And, and now that I think about this, I'd, I'd really say false expectations. I, I mean, they believed that Jesus was dead, right? I mean, the crucifixion happened just three days earlier. It's, it, on Friday, they, they knew Jesus was dead. They knew he was buried. They knew the tomb was empty, but, but they weren't expecting a, you know, or looking for a walking, breathing, talking Jesus, so they didn't focus on, on who he was, uh, and, and, and they missed him because their expectations were false. And sometimes what we think about God or what somebody has, you know, taught us that's wrong, you know, shapes our expectations, and we miss God when he's right there working in our midst. And, and then the other thing that causes us just to, to miss him when he's right in front of us is just self-centeredness, uh, self-absorption because you won't be able to see Jesus very well if you're always looking in the mirror, right? If it's all about you and what you need, what you want, what you're focused on, uh, you're really not gonna be able to, to see Jesus because if you're focused on yourself, it blinds you to Jesus. He just kind of becomes fuzzy. So they missed Jesus until their eyes were opened. Now, can you imagine sitting there and, uh, and Jesus broke the bread and suddenly they went, it's him. Now, he vanished, so they couldn't go, you know, explain, but they got up and went back and shared what had happened. Uh, so, let me ask you this. What happened to open your eyes to the Savior? What happened in your life to open your eyes to Jesus? Uh, you know, what, what are the events that occurred that you realized who Jesus was and you surrendered your life to following him? I, I, I guess, uh, really, it's, what is the story of how Jesus changed your life? So, uh, my story, I grew up in church, like always there. Uh, you know, in the old days, I would say I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, <laughs> Wednesday night, special events, it was always there. Um, 
and, and because of that, and because, uh, you know, they taught me the stories of Scripture, I trusted Jesus as my Savior when I was eight years old. I made a decision that I wanted Jesus to be my Lord. And, uh, and then at 16, when I was at youth camp and uh, full of self-loathing and, and really didn't like my life, uh, I kind of prayed a prayer of surrender and said, Jesus, I don't like me, but you do, and so you can have me. You can take over my life. And I've kind of been continuing to pray that prayer ever since, although I like me a whole lot better than now than then. Uh, so that's my story. I, I can tell you how Jesus has changed my life along the way. Uh, do you have a story of life change? It, it, do you, thank you. Someone, there's one person in the room that does. <laughs> Everyone else right now needs to repent. Uh, so, okay, do you have a story of life change? Okay. If you said yes, or even nodded your head, then you need, here's your assignment. You need to share it with someone today, okay? I, I mean, a lot of you are going go to go out to eat after the service, then, you know, over, over dinner, whoever you're having lunch with or whatever, share that story with them. Just go ahead and, and you guys exchange stories of how, how Jesus changed your life. Or in life group this week. You know, if you're in a life group, which you should be in a life group, then uh, share the story of how did Jesus change your life. You know, what were the events? What occurred? Uh, or, or maybe you don't have either of those. Just sit down with your family. If you've got kids at home, do this. Tell them how Jesus changed your life so they understand, you know, why you drag them to church and they're okay with it because they have fun in the kids' wing. But, but, you know, if you have a story of life change, tell somebody what that story is. That, that's your assignment. This week, do it. And, and I say this week, but I really mean today. Do it today because if you put it off, you'll forget um, now, if you didn't say yes, if you didn't nod your head, if you really answered in your heart, no, I don't have a story of life change, or you know that God hasn't changed your life, no matter how religious you've been or haven't been, uh, life change can happen right now. Right now, it, it, it's, it's the process of surrender. It's simply asking God to forgive your sins and confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's that first step of saying, Jesus, I need you. I am hopeless without you. Please save me. And, and here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you haven't done that, look, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if you would like to do that today, or if you just did it right now, or if you want to talk to someone about that, our prayer team is going to be here at the end of the service. Talk to them. Grab one of the Connect cards right now while you're, you're, you're courageous and fill it out and say, I want to talk to a pastor about Jesus. We would love to share with you how you can experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you know Jesus as your Savior, but you would like to see him better, you'd like to see him more clearly, then uh, it's easier to see Jesus when we care for others. Can I, can I just tell you that? It's easier to see Jesus when we care for others. Just like I could see with glasses so much better when I put them on. I mean, I, I wasn't technically blind before. I just couldn't see things clearly. Here's how it works. Spiritually, we can see better when we serve other people. That, I mean, that's a reality. If you're thinking, I really, my, my relationship with Jesus needs to go deeper, then you're gonna see him more clearly when you decide you're gonna care for other people more. Now, I share that, uh, and, uh, and when I share that, I'm thinking about a parable that Jesus told. It's found in Matthew 25, if you wanna look it up later. Uh, it, it's an amazing and, and terrifying and wonderful parable of judgment. Jesus said, uh, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and he will gather the nations together and he will separate them as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then he will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me, and I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? 
When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you naked and clothe you or a stranger and invite you in? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say, truly I say to you, as you did this to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Now, the rest of the parable is exactly the same conversation to the group labeled the unrighteous. And, and the king says to them, uh, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty. You did not give me anything to drink. You didn't meet my needs. And they will say, Lord, when did we see you? And Jesus answers, as you did not do it to the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do it to me. Uh, if you want to see Jesus more clearly, serve others. I'm just, I'm just telling you, if you want to see Jesus, serve others. Uh, bless the least of these. It changes their lives and it changes your life. It really is that simple. And some of you are stuck in, in that place of, you know, spiritual uh, blurriness because you're not stepping into that place of caring for other people. You're not taking care of the least of these. If you haven't figured it out yet by the t-shirts and by the tables out in the foyer, this is Compassion Weekend. It's Compassion Weekend. We're, we're focusing on the ministry of Calvary with Compassion. We've partnered with Compassion International for decades as a church. Uh, I've sponsored Children of Compassion personally for about 30 years. Uh, and today, I want to introduce you to somebody who's a representative of Compassion International. So, uh, Owen Gethanga, would you come on out here? We're, we're back here someplace. Owen, come on out. Hey, welcome. Now, Owen uh, was blessed to be a child. You can adjust that stool any way you want because I had to move mine. Uh, he was blessed uh, to be a, a, a sponsored child of Compassion and, uh, and so now he actually works for Compassion International. And so, uh, have you ever been applauded for having a job before? It's, <laughs> it's happening more and more in this day and age. So, Owen, uh, glad you were here. Thank you for traveling uh, all the way from Colorado to come be with us this weekend. Uh, and, and I've heard a little bit of your story, but uh, what was your life like before you were involved with Compassion? Yeah, praise the Lord, church. Amen. So my name is Owen Gitanga, and uh, I was born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, ever since I was a little boy, I, I had a dream. My dream was a little bit different because I never wanted to become, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or a pilot. But for some weird reason, I always wanted to become an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I found out soon enough that that would never happen. It would never happen because of the family that I was born in. And I was born in a family of three boys and my mom, who was really our own, uh, our sole breadwinner, and she would bring in about five to ten dollars a month. Five to ten dollars a month to be able to support uh, three kids, that was impossible. And so I grew up in what you would call extreme poverty. And so life for me uh, consisted of waking up in the morning and having no idea when the next plate of food would come from. And sometimes it would go for days without having food to eat. And, uh, and if you've ever gone for a day or so without having food to eat, you become desperate. You would absolutely do anything just to get food in your stomach. And really, that's what pushed me to going and knocking on people's doors, begging for food, because I had to survive. And, uh, and so I had knocked on these people's doors so many times that they were tired of seeing my face over and over again. And so when I knocked on their door one more time and they opened the door and so my face, a lot of times they shut the door on my face. And uh, the few times they let me in, they, you know, they made the point to humiliate me and my mom just because she wouldn't be able to provide us with food. And that was hard, but I needed the food to survive. And so I had to keep knocking on those doors. We never had faucets uh, or taps. And so really the source of water that we had came from a, a river that originated in a slaughterhouse. And you can imagine all that waste going into the river, and that's, that's the same water we would drink out of. Uh, we had a statement growing up that if it's brown, it's good enough to drink. And uh, 
one of the worst things about growing up in poverty was that every time we got sick, my mom would tell us that, just hope that you're going to be fine because I do not have the money to take you to hospital. And uh, back in those days, if you showed up in a hospital, you know, and one of the first things they would ask you is whether you had insurance or money. And if you didn't have either of those, they would not take you in. And so every time we got sick, my mom would just tell us, uh, go to bed and hopefully when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be fine. And my mom shared with me this story that when I was about one year old, I came down with measles. And there was a huge measles outbreak in Kenya that ended up taking the lives of so many kids. And she told me that that night as she held me, because she couldn't take me to a hospital. She didn't think I would make it through the end of the night because I grew weaker and weaker. And I mean, as a parent now, I, I can't imagine what was going on in my mom's mind. You know, kind of seeing my life slip away and there was nothing she could do about it. You know, but by the, by the grace of God, I survived just like so many other times in my life. And I mean, poverty is bad. I would never wish poverty on anybody. But for me, the absolute worst thing about poverty wasn't just a lack of food or clothes or, you know, clean water or not being able to go to hospital. The absolute worst thing about poverty is the hopelessness that comes from poverty. Is what people, when people looked at me straight in the eyes, one of the first things that they said to me was that I am worth less and I will never amount to anything. And they went on to kind of show, you know, my, the, my lineage and my, my family, we were all stuck in this cycle of poverty that no one seemed to break out of. And when they asked me this question that we love to ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, with a smile in my face, I told them that I want to become an accountant. Uh, but it's what they told me in return that kind of wiped the smile out of my face mm. and really crushed the little hope that I still had because they told me, don't waste your time dreaming because none of your dreams will ever come true. The kind of words that just break your heart. And, but it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was, it was an everyday thing until I, I started to believe that that's my story, that I was born poor and hopeless, and there was nothing I could do about it. So you're in extreme poverty. You're broken. You're hopeless. Um, so how did God change your life through compassion? Yeah, and uh, so I was about eight years old, and my mom told me to go get ready uh, because there was an announcement in our city that had gone out about this church that was helping kids, and that was my first encounter with compassion. So for there to be a compassion program, there has to be a church. And so I did not know that when my mom held my hand and we walked through the gates of this church, that would change my life forever. But, you know, I went into the church, and Compassion has to do an audit and, you know, background check to make sure that, that the kids that really, you know, want to be sponsored, they really do need the help. And uh, in my case, it didn't take very much convincing that we needed the help. Mm -hmm. And so I got registered, and one of the first things they did is they took a picture of me and uh, printed a packet just like Sophia's, and... Uh, they sent it to an event in America, and uh, a guy walking by the table saw my picture on a packet and, you know, this, and said, I'm going to sponsor this kid. And so I got my first sponsor, and uh, funny story about the picture, my first picture that I took with compassion. One of our friends played a trick on us and told us that the camera flash is really painful. And so... <laughs> My first compassion picture, I, I was probably waiting for the pain that never <laughs> seemed to arrive. And, uh, we laughed about it later on. And, uh, but when I got sponsored, my sponsor started to write me letters. And uh, one of the first letters that I got from my sponsor, you know, it had three words that no one had ever said to me before. It had the words, I love you. And the first time I had ever heard those words was, reading this letter that, you know, that was handwritten and sent all the way from America. And it, it, just, that, it, just, it just blew my mind to think that somebody thought that I was lovable. And then he went on to talk about Jesus. And if you don't get anything from what I say today, is that from the first time I stepped foot into that church, 
these people at the Compassion Center would not shut up talking about Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea who Christ was, and then until I started going to this church, I mean, and these people were so loving, and, and they were so warm towards me, and it, it was just, and the words, you know, that was in the word, it's like we, we memorized scriptures, and uh, we meditated on scriptures, and we sang all these happy songs and all these worship songs. And, you know, talking about this God who had a hope and a future for my life, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a different message that I, than I used to hear when I was growing up. You know, talking about this God whom I am his workmanship, this God whom nothing is impossible to, this God in whom I have a hope and a future. And, I mean, that was a lot of good news until I went back home to the same people who looked at me and thought absolutely nothing about me. And I lived in these two different worlds for a while. Frankly, I was being pulled apart because on one side, the Holy Spirit kept convicting me. And on the other side, the enemy kept pulling me down. And so I thought maybe if I go to the church and accept their Jesus, maybe these people will kind of tone it down talking about Jesus <laughs> and I'll be at peace. And so I went to the church and I said, I've come to accept you, Jesus, thinking that, hey, you know, once I finally accept their Jesus, maybe these people will move on to the next person who <laughs> in line. <laughs> but I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And no, these people did not tone it down talking about <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I think they actually cranked it up talking about Jesus. But I had made a decision that would change the rest of my life. And I remember going home that night, and the more I thought about it, is this, is I, is I, I imagined these people have been nothing but loving to me. And they are presenting this option that I have never had in my life. And so I decided I have nothing to lose. I decided, why don't I try this Jesus that these people keep talking to me about and see if what they say is really true. And so I got into the Word, and I started this relationship with Jesus, and something started to happen, is that the more I got into the Word, is the more I knew the truth, and the truth started to set me free. Amen. Amen. And I can say this today without a doubt in my mind, the poverty left my life the day Christ came into my life. Amen. Amen. That if compassion had just given me Jesus and told me to go my way, I would have been just fine. But compassion didn't stop there. They gave me food and clean water, took me to hospital every time I got sick. They took me to school, and I was the first person in my whole family to graduate high school. And I went on to college, and I did my bachelor's degree, and guess what? <laughs> Accounting. <laughs> and And then I got a scholarship to go to North Dakota State, of all the states in America. <laughs> and, uh, and I did my master's degree in accounting and sat for my CPA license, and I'm a CPA in America. I'm an accountant! <laughs> <laughs> Probably not your typical accountant, but I'm excited because this is the one thing they told me not to waste my time dreaming. Mm. But me walking through the doors of that church changed my whole life forever. And I'm standing here today representing what compassion does. I have been released from poverty in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sorry, we're just listening to you going, this is good stuff. Hey. All right, you're, you're working for Compassion International. You're a, uh, an accountant, a CPA. And there are so many voices out there asking people to give. Give to this, give to this, give to this. I mean, every time I open up social media, there's somebody else asking for money for something. And, and we're real big here at Calvary on, on financial accountability. We want the money to go to the people uh, that it's designated for uh, and all of our missions and all of our, our uh, generosity. Why should people trust Compassion uh, instead of those other organizations? Why, why, why is Compassion a trustworthy ministry uh, that we should invest in? Yeah, and 
I think I can speak. I can speak as a sponsored child because I've been through this. And, uh, you know, my relationship with my sponsor changed my life. The letters I got from him and, you know, my sponsor's name, one of the reasons he sponsored me was because we shared the same name. So my sponsor's name was Owen. And that's, that's the reason why he decided to sponsor me. And uh, we had a great relationship. Uh, you know, he would encourage me and he, he would send me pictures of, you know, his family, and I had, I had them on my wall, bedroom wall, and every time, every night before I went to bed, I made sure that I prayed for each and every one of his kids, and he, uh, you know, and him and his, and his wife. Uh, and then, so about 10 years ago, I, you know, I got married to my wife, the love of my life, and that's beautiful. Uh, but I also had something special happen that day. You know, this guy, I, I called him big bro, and he called me small bro, and... Uh, on our biggest day, Owen, my, my compassion sponsor, was the best man in our wedding. And uh, I don't know if you have the pictures. There it is. Yeah. And his son Simon is our ring bearer. And it's, when you sponsor a child, it's the discipleship that, that you get in turn to speak life into those kids. My sponsor spoke life into my life. And, you know, when I caught on to that, and that helped me push through poverty. But I can also speak as a sponsor because me and my wife were sponsored three kids through Compassion. So we have three boys of our own, uh, but we also sponsor three kids through Compassion. And, and I've been fortunate enough to meet two of our kids. And the next picture there is a picture of me and Joseph. And uh, so I try to do the same thing I, my sponsor did to me. So, because my sponsor sponsored me because we share the same name. So with Joseph... I was at, at this event, and I saw this packet of this kid, and his last name on the packet was Gitanga. Mm -hmm. Gitanga is my last name. And there was no way I wasn't going to sponsor <laughs> that kid. Because for you to have the name Gitanga, it means we have a 70% chance that we're related. And so I sponsored him, and then later on when Compassion sent me the paperwork, I actually realized that Compassion had misspelled his name. <laughs> uh, I, I understand. My name can be, uh, can be difficult. And so they, 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 had, uh, they had just, uh, instead, of an, uh, instead of an I, they put an N. So his name is Gitaiga. My name is Gitanga. <laughs> it's very close. We still love him, Joseph. <laughs> but I can tell you, it's the best $38 a month that we ever spend every month. Because I know what it means for those kids. I was on the other side, and I know what it meant, you know, to be a sponsored child, just to be, to get the chance to be loved on, equipped with, you know, skills, because uh, that's one of the things that Compassion is really big, big, big about, is uh, if accounting would, didn't work out for me, I probably would have started my own bakery shop or started shoemaking, because every kid that goes through the program gets the opportunity to learn a couple crafts that they can in turn use as an income generating activity. But as of a year ago, I started working for Compassion as an accountant. <laughs> and uh, so I love Compassion as a, you know, as a sponsored child and as a sponsor. And until I actually started working for them, and I, and, and, you know, so I get, you know, I get, to, I, get to, I get to do their books on a monthly basis, look at their financial statements, and one of the things that I love compassion even more now, and this is a CPA speaking, I love compassion because of their financial integrity. They do what they say they do. And their books actually reflect that. And, and so if I, would, if I would encourage you to sponsor a child, I would tell you to do it. You know, not only has it changed my life, but it has all, also changed the life of my family. Because as a result of me being sponsored, I've been able to go back and take my whole family out of poverty. You know, so poverty... Yeah. I always seem to, to be stuck in this generational cycle of poverty until compassion came into my life. And poverty stopped with me. Mm -hmm. My kids don't know what poverty is. Mm -hmm. Because someone picked my packet out of, you know, in a table full of so many kids. And as a result of that, I cut poverty out of my life and I cut poverty out of my whole family's life forever. But the most important thing about compassion is because I was sponsored, 
I get to have life and have it eternally. Amen. But not only that, because I got sponsored, I got to take Jesus to my whole family. And I mean, there's nothing as beautiful as that. Don't... Amen. Amen. Well, Owen, uh, your story is inspiring. It's amazing. And I just want to say thank you again for coming and sharing it with us. And uh, we're going to close up the service here in just a minute. But I, I just, uh, let's just again express our appreciation for him. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, we serve the God of life change. You just heard a story of dramatic, incredible life change, uh, Owen's story. And here's the thing, we want Jesus to change your life. I don't know if you got it from him, but he wants Jesus to change your life as well. Uh, and, and, and Jesus not only wants to change your life, but he wants to use your life to impact others. And I, look, our world's a mess. Yeah, I know you guys watch the news way too much. And then you get depressed, you get angry, you get frustrated. Uh, our world is a mess. And there is not one of us in this room or joining us online that can change the world. But you know what you do have the power to do? You have the power to change the world for one person. At least one person. Uh, now, when you leave whether you're uh, in Parker or in uh, Havasu, there's tables out there that have children that uh, are just like Owen. They're living in extreme poverty, uh, and they've gotten included in a program that's connected to a local church, and they're waiting for someone to help change their life, to be a sponsor. And they'll explain all that, how you can sign up, how you can do that. You can go out there and, and, and pick a child if you want to. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, I, I already told you, I've been sponsoring Children of Compassion, Merald and I have for about 30 years. Uh, right now, we sponsor a child for each of our grandkids. Actually, uh, we have five grandkids, and we sponsor six Compassion children right now because I was trying to give my daughters a hint. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think it's working, so, uh, but that's Okay. And, 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 and I just want you to understand, we're, we're supporting Compassion whether you go out there and pick up a card or not because Calvary has already raised money to build one Compassion Center, help sponsor a church in Honduras. We have money for a second one. That's 600 children that we're going to impact directly as a congregation. And as a church, we've sponsored uh, about 473 kids and given over $730,000 towards Compassion Children. Now, that is, uh, that's all amazing stuff, but here's what, here's what I know. I want your spiritual eyesight to get better. I want you to be able to see Jesus more clearly, and I think that that'll happen if you care, if you invest in, if you serve the least of these. Um, one day, we're, we're gonna be there with Jesus and I want to be on that group on the right when he says, I was hungry and you fed me. Um, however you do it, make sure that you don't fail that test. It's kind of a big one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you show compassion on us. You have cared for us in amazing ways. You've sent people into our lives to tell us the story of Jesus, that, that we have experienced life change through that. And God, you've blessed us incredibly. We know that. We can count the blessings, we can see them, and they're so obvious to us. And Lord, um, because you've blessed us, we wanna be a blessing to others. We wanna, we wanna tell people about Jesus. We wanna serve people here locally. Uh, we wanna give to missions around the world, uh, but God, we can make a difference in the lives of individuals, whether they're local or whether they're distant. And, and I just pray that you'd move in people's lives tonight so that our eyes could get clearer and our heart would grow bigger and our love for you would increase because we understand that to be blessed uh, is to become a blessing. So Lord, uh, we're your servants, we're your children, and, and we want to honor you in everything that we do. 
So we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.